Welcome back to Think Design Work Smart. I'm Alex Bolbach and I'm coming at you from the Mosaic Work Studios. And what I have for you today is a little bit different than what I'm usually doing. I'll try to mix things up a little bit. The main topic for today will be a, di a discussion and a deeper analysis of the XZ backdoor injection. Um, and in case you don't know, what I'm talking about, stick with me because the story is incredible and it shows some of the things that we need to pay attention to when we are using packages that we don't know where they come and who contributed to them. But I, before we go into the main topic, I'd like to talk very briefly about a few things that pique my interest. So we'll start with uh, three uh, stories that are just uh, I'll just touch upon them if you are interested in any of the these stories and you want a deeper analysis please let me know you can contact us at tdws at mosaicworks.com with a z mosaicworks and um, or you can contact me on twitter mastodon uh, LinkedIn, uh, find me there. In other news, uh, I will probably soon announce this. Uh, we are waiting for the official announcement, but I, if you are in Oxford or in London or in Brescia or, or in Cluj, I will be there for uh, a business trip and then for talks. So I will announce the dates let me know and maybe we can have a cup of coffee or you know a chat all right let's get this started first new first um, post that captured my attention was from tim ottinger also known as agile otter um, a post on twitter people tend to believe that there is some constant k such that story points tam K equals actual hours. This is naive. It seems completely reasonable, and yet it is almost perfectly wrong. And that is correct. Um, the whole idea with story points was that we don't estimate in hours anymore, and we try instead to figure out what is the complexity or the uh, work necessary to uh, solve something. And the, the biggest problem here, you know, user stories should be uh, defined as a problem that you are solving rather than as a feature that you are adding. And so, so this is a very long conversation. Somebody says, I was at places where that was explicit, one point equals one day or one point equals half a day. I've seen this again and again and again. It happens particularly in... Um, scenarios where managers try to compare teams based on velocity and so they say okay let's just skip all the all this thing with points and just you know set a point to uh, predefined value or the team decides to do that and it's uh, yeah it's basically wrong but if you are interested let me know uh, second story very interesting um, Christian Findlay, uh, whom I actually am going to start following now, because he asks a very interesting question. What is a domain model supposed to represent exactly? A database schema, business process, some code in a UI API. Once you have one, what do you do with it? Convert it to code, use it as a, a reference, stick it in a Git folder and never look at it again. Very interesting question. Um, this shows to me that I hope more people are looking at domain-driven design as a way to uh, design the, and to create architectures for their products and particularly for large systems. I hope inside larger organizations. This is the only way I know of that we can use to maximize our chances to create something that stands the test of time. Um, 
And the reason is if you manage to identify the domain model, the domain model changes slowly, which means that you can base everything upon the domain model and it will be fairly stable as a system. Of course, you, you will need to change technologies, implementations, and so on. Hopefully not uh, that much, but the domain model tends to kind of st stay stable until, well, the, the organization goes into another business or, and then you have to discover another domain model or uh, unless something very specific happens to the market and changes the domain model. But in general, the domain model is fairly stable. So if you start from, from it, you can get architectures that are stable. The problem is it's not as easy to figure out the domain model. And the way I explain it is a domain model is fundamentally a jargon. So a jargon is a subset of a language that's specific to a domain. So that's basically what we are doing. We are doing linguistics. And this is why it's, I keep saying, you know, advanced and good software development is actually a very humanistic activity. And you can see here, domain models are basically a jargon. And if you look at uh, the first answer is from Robert Ma C. Martin, a domain model is the intellectual and linguistic framework used to facilitate communication between stakeholders. It consists of a constrained set of nouns, verbs, adjectives, and other parts of speech interconnected by specific relationships, a so-called ubiquitous language. A domain model is not a database schema, an entity relationship model, a class model, a state model, or any other kind of software design model. Those models can be partially derived from the domain model, but they might also incorporate issues outside of the domain. So this is what the domain model is, and it's a jargon. And because it's a jargon, we need to use that's basically the definition of a jargon, right? Constrained sets of nouns, verb, adjectives, and other parts of speech interconnected by specific relationships. This is what the jargon is. So you t define the domain model and then you can derive from it and it can inform the way you structure your code, your database, your microservices, if you use microservices, your modular monolith, if you use modular monolith, your serverless um, architecture, your CQRS architecture, your event-driven architecture. It informs any type of architecture that you can use. Uh, so, and it's very powerful because it's stable. It doesn't change as much as anything else. It doesn't change as much as user interfaces. It doesn't change as much as the user needs. It tends to stay st stabler, if I can say this. Now, if you want to learn more about this, uh, we already had a few very interesting uh, videos um, where we reviewed articles and reacted to articles on uh, domain-driven design and domain models. Uh, so yeah, uh, check those out. And if you want more details, let us know. All right, and the last piece of news for today, which is very, very funny to me. Uh, so it turns out that AI generation, LLMs, LLMs gen are basically always confabulating. Uh, this is the actual way of working of any large language model. When you ask them to do something, they are not putting any logic into it, right? Their goal is to create, and they are optimized for creating something that is uh, convincing. And that something that is convincing is not necessary to have any connection with the reality or with logic, which is why often if you try to generate images, you will see people who have five, uh, 
six fingers or four fingers or three hands or any kinds of variations because an LLM has no notion of what is a hand and what are fingers and that the hand is to have five fingers and so on. It doesn't have this semantic built in. Uh, and this problem of confabulation, typically known as hallucination, the, the correct term seems to be confabulation, but most people know, know it as hallucination, um, applies as well when generating code. And when you generate code, it's very possible that you give the LLM a problem and it generates a code that includes a library that doesn't exist, that is just imagining, hallucinating, confabulating. And by the way, this is how this system works at their core. So it's not that it's a side effect. This is the way they work. <laughs> okay. They are always confabulating, not sometimes hallucinating. That's uh, a big difference. And uh, a researcher noticed that there were uh, similar, so the same package name, the same library name was generated by LLMs and decided to actually create this package with that name and it had 30,000 downloads in three months and appeared in many repos. Which shows that you can inject code that is very, that in this case, it didn't do anything. It was just for computing, for counting how many downloads, how many people will actually be using it. But uh, imagine if that code would actually be something like a virus or a malware or, you know, spyware or whatever. Uh, that could be really bad, okay? So I keep saying this, and when I we did the first videos on AI, on LLMs, the one thing that you need to know about LLMs is you'll always need to, if you are using one, you need to be in a cycle of uh, prompt, create a prompt, generate something, review then adjust the prompt generate review adjust the prompt generate review until you end with something that you can start from and maybe change edit improve okay this is the only way it makes sense because of this confabulation problem so will ai write uh, code instead of you Nah, probably not. Will it be able to generate some of the common types of things that we are doing repeatedly? Probably yes. But you'll still need somebody who knows what they are doing to review the code. Because otherwise you might end up with this. So pay a lot of attention to what packages it's using and if they are valid and so on. I'll leave the links to all these three... Uh, posts and now let's go to the main topic so the main topic is the xz backdoor um, and let's talk about what is xz let's quickly uh, i have a few materials here that i can show you XZ utilities is a collection of open source tools and libraries for the xz compression format so think like zip or gzip, only it's a different algorithm. That are used for high compression ratios with support for multiple compression algorithm, notably LZMA2. Okay, so this is a tool that is in, is form of two things. One is the library libLZMA, and the other one is a command line tool called XZ. And on top of that, of course, there are some graphical interfaces and so on, but these are the most important parts. 
and these two are installed on virtually every Linux machine, including servers, including desktops, uh, probably on your Android device. If you are using Brew on your Mac OS, it's, chances are XZ is installed as well on Mac OS. So very widespread, a tool that is in use in a lot of places. And what happened on Friday, 29th of March, so last Friday, at the point of this uh, recording, Andes Freund, Principal Software Engineering at Microsoft, emailed OSS Security informing the community of a discovery of a backdoor in LZMA version 5.6.0 and 5.6.1. Now, before we move forward, uh, a few things about this story. This is a crazy story. Uh, 5.6.0 and 5.6.1 were the latest versions or some of the newer ones. And it takes a while for these versions to go into the main distributions because the main uh, Linux distributions are very concerned with stability. So for example, if you have something like Debian, Debian was, if I remember correctly, was testing this version, but it was not yet released. So only people who were kind of working with this code or who were you know, developing for Debian wanted to have the, um, the very last, the cutting edge version of the distribution would have problems. This is, as far as I can tell, it has not been w widespread. Uh, at least the back door, but the question, the problem is what happened and how it got there. And then the crazy story is how it was discovered. Uh, and I'm going to go into this. So, and here's what happened because basically the, the attack was a long, a very long prong attack. Uh, it took about three years. As you can see, starting from 2021 until, yeah, recently, 16 February 2024. Um, and um, in the meantime, many things happened. Uh, but the biggest problem with this is that the exit tools and the LZMA library, they were maintained by one person. Let me just switch to this. Uh, so Lasse Colin um, was the main maintainer for Exe. And the problem is, you know, when you are when you start an open source project, um, it usually starts because you need something done for you or because you have found an interesting problem. And then you kind of start with it as a hobby. But then once people start using it, they ask you for improvements and then there's no way you can keep up with improvements. And at some point, users can become anxious and annoyed. And if it's only one person maintaining this, and even or even if it's like a small group that is distributed and working now and again uh, on things they are interested in, uh, it all falls down on the maintainer at the end because somebody needs to verify and increase integrate uh, the changes. So it, it gets, it can get very difficult with these uh, tools that are used by a lot of people. And that's what the social part of this attack 
was based on. Um, so 2021 GRT75, known as Giatan, creates their GitHub account. We don't even know if this person is real. It could be a group of people, um, could be state actors, could be any number of uh, organizations here, or it could be just one person uh, with a, an, a operating under a pseudonym. The first comments they make are not to exhibit, but they are deeply suspicious. Specifically, they open a PR in LibArchive, edit the error text warning when untaring with BSD tar. This commit does a little more than it says. It replaces safe print, F print with an unsafe variant, potentially introducing another vulnerability. The code was merged without any dis discussion and was patched recently. LibArchive should also be considered compromised until proven otherwise. Well, it was patched recently, so no problem anymore. Uh, so this was 2021 when they create their GitHub account. Then 2022, in April 2022, Gia Tan submitted a page via mailing list. The contents of the page are not relevant by the events that follow are. A new persona, Jigar Kumar, enters and begins pressuring for this page to be merged. Soon after, Jigar Kumar begins pressuring Lasse Colin to add another maintainer to XZ. In the fallout, there is much to learn about mental health in open source. Three days after the email is pressuring Lasse Colin to add another maintainer, GRT75 makes their first commit to TZ, test created tests for hardware functions. Since this commit, they become a regular contributor to XZ. They are currently the second most active. It's unclear exactly when they become trusted in this repository. So, this person or group or whatever they are, take advantage of the fact that the maintainer cannot keep up, uh, contribute to the project with uh, various contributions. They actually become the second most active contributor. And then they slide their way into becoming a maintainer. So gain the trust of the maintainer and take some of the work off their hands. And this is how it all starts. Uh, Jigar Kumar is never seen again. Another account, Danny Sands, also participates in pressure with a similar name plus number formatted email. This account is also never seen outside of exit discussion and neither have any associated accounts that have been discovered. 2023, GRT75 merges their first commit on January 7, 2023, which gives us a good indication of when they gain, they fully gain trust. So it took them two years, but they got into the inner circle, let's say. In March, the primary contract email in Google's OSS fuzz is updated to be GIAs instead of Lassie Collins. Testing infrastructure it will be using this exploit is committed. Despite Lasse Colin being attributed as the author for this, Giatan committed it and it was originally written by Hans Janssen in June. So it could be, uh, it, it seems to be a, a more complex operation involving multiple fake accounts. Hans Janssen's account was seemingly made specifically to create this pull request. There is very little activity before and after. They were later pushed for, for the compromised version of XZ to be included in Debian. So it seems that 2023, okay, and now we are 2024. Uh, in July, a uh, pull request was opened in OSS Fast to disable iFunk for fuzzing builds due to issues introduced by the changes above. So this appears to be deliberate to mask the malicious changes that will be introduced soon. So basically they asked for changes in the build process. Uh, I think in Debian was this, ah, in OSS Fast. So in a tool that checks for possible problems possible security problems. And they open a pull request in order to change their tool in order to mask 
the security issue that's being introduced with the new version of uh, the this package of XZ. Also, GRT75 opened the issue about a warning in CLang that, while indeed incorrect, drew attention to iFunks. So, again, trying to cover their, their tracks. And if you don't know, CLang is one of the compilers for uh, C++. 2024. A pull request for Google's OSS fuzz is open that changes the URL for the project from tucaniorg xz to xz.tucani.org slash xz-utils. Tucani.org is hosted in Finland at, as a hosting company. The xz subdomain, meanwhile, points to GitHub pages. This furthers the amount of control that GIA has over the project. So basically changes the website to point to GitHub where he has full control. A commit containing the final steps required to execute this backdoor is added to the repository. And the commits are called tests, add a few test files, tests, update two test files. But this is not what they are doing. <laughs> and we're going to do uh, a little bit of uh, analysis in a moment. The discovery. So this takes us to last Friday. An email is sent to the OSS security mailing list backdooring upstream LZMA leading to SSH server compromise, announcing this discovery and doing its best to explain the exploit chain. Okay, and this is where the story gets crazy because the reason why this tool was, this um, exploit was found is because uh, this person from who's an engineer on Microsoft was working on embedded systems and noticed the lag of a half a second when starting the tool. <laughs> and he said, okay, so it's taking too long. Let me investigate. And then he finds out that basically what the tool was doing was starting a server that would allow remote access. But let's uh, let's read the uh, the initial message because it's really funny. It, it's fascinating. I was doing some micro benchmarking at the time, needed to quiet the system to reduce noise. Uh, so it was uh, based on the context I found in other system in other uh, posts. Um, it's about embedded systems. So not about a laptop or computer and so on. So reducing noise, the noise level might be different in that case. So SSHD processes was using a surprising amount of CPU despite immediately failing because of wrong usernames. Profiled SSHD showing lots of CPU time in lib LZMA with perf unable to attribute it to a symbol. Got suspicious. Recall that I had seen an odd Valgrin complaint in automated testing of Postgres a few weeks earlier after package updates. Really required a lot of coincidences. Okay, a gist has been published with a great high level technical overview and what you need to know. In addition to the gist and the email above, several analysis attempts had begun emerging. And so there's a bunch of uh, things here. A request for the val number of version to be included in Debian is opened by Hans, so another uh, another account. This request was opened the same week Hans Debian GitLab account was created. The account created a few similar update requests in various low traffic repositories to build credibility after asking for this one. So this is a very complex operation, right? They don't just go to say, you know, with the same account. Okay, let's include this or something like this. I mean, it could have been the same account. No, it's a different account. They build some credibility first and and then they uh, go for the exploit. So it's, it's a pattern, right? Take your time, build credibility, go for the exploit. 
Several other suspicious anonymous name plus number accounts with little former activity also push for its inclusion, including Miso Eater 91 and Krigodin 4545, uh, whose PGP key was made two days before joining the discussion. And okay, and now remember they mentioned the Valgrind bug. So Valgrind is a tool that can be used for remember correctly for static analysis yeah various analysis tool for memory trading cache branch and heap profiling so probably the valgrind for debian is making specific checks and um, this is this was a problem for injecting um, this malware. The Valgrim bugs mentioned were introduced by this malicious injection, as noted in the email to SA security. Subsequently, the injected code caused Valgrim errors and crashes in some configuration due to stack layout differing from what the backdoor was expecting. These issues were attempted to be worked around in 5.6.1. A pull request to Go library by one password employee is opened asking to upgrade the library to the vulnerable version. However, it was all unfortunate timing. One password reached out by email referring me to this comment and everything seems to check out. Uh, so people were waiting for the new version, okay? And they expected for, for this. Uh, Fedora contributor states that Jia were pushing for its inclusion in Fedora as it contains great new features. Jiatan also attempted to get into Ubuntu days before the beta freeze. So it was, he was, or they were trying, it's probably a group, they were trying to push this change into the Ubuntu beta, um, which is a version that will presumably go to many people who are testing the betas. A few hours after all this came out, GitHub suspended GSK75's account. They also banned the repository, meaning people can no longer audit the changes made to it without resorting to mirrors. Immensely helpful, GitHub. This is irony. They also suspended Elastic Collins' account, which is completely disgraceful. Well, they kind of went, <laughs> you know, uh, how is it called in English? Um, scorched earth policy. <laughs> Just suspended everyone <laughs> until they can figure out what happened. Asa has begun reverting changes introduced by Gia, so now more work for the guy who is actually doing the good work, including one that added a sneaky period to disable the sandbox. They also have published a FAQ that begins to explain the situation. Um, okay, so we don't really know who Gia is. Now, there are some people trying to figure out who he is or whether they are, and okay. So that's, uh, that's very interesting. Now, what does this actually do? Um, the technical stuff is also interesting, because until now we discussed about the social part and how it was discovered. But let's talk a little bit about the technical aspects. Um, so they had uh, one of the things they added was a malicious build to host .m4 file, added to git ignore, later incorporated to the package release. So they added a file that is a macro that is executed during the build process and runs the malicious code below. And, well, in case you're listening, I'm sorry, I cannot read this code. It does, uh, so sed does uh, some replacements. Uh, I don't know exactly what it's doing, but basically the end of it is that it it hooks into the build process to create a corrupt build. Um, and if if I understood correctly, I don't have all the details here. There, there's a lot of stuff you need to, to go into. 
but if I understand correctly, uh, what it's doing is it's injecting some binary or obfuscated uh, code into the build. Uh, so let's see if we if you can grasp from here. Uh, we have um, this uh, build to host that does a substitution to anchor our malform exe file, replaces some uh, um, slash t with 0x to 0, white space 0x to 0 with 0, uh, 0x09. Ah, so it actually does a bunch of uh, replacements. 0x2d, which is minus, is replaced with 0x5f, and 0x5f is replaced with 0x2d. Ah, so it basically uh, substitution to uncorruptible form exe file. It creates an uncorrupted but a bad file because of all these substitutions. And then it has a bash file that has some bytes in the comment. It does a custom substitution. And then it goes into test files with large compressed LZMA, decompress the file with exe minus dash DC, remove junk data from the file using multiple head call tool calls, portion of the file is discarded, contains the binary backdoor, use custom substitution cipher to decipher the data, decipher data is decompressed using exe dash F raw dash dash LZMA one dash DC. And it goes into a bash file that does a backdoor extraction, extracts uh, a .o file, so an object file, that is then uh, decompressed, stored, and then the tool uses an extension mechanism to basically run this. Leaves the libelzma la crc 64 festo which is a backdoor file, a binary backdoor file that was created through a complex set of um, changes. Well, each change is relatively simple, but when you put them together, it just obfuscates the whole process. So if you take anything out of it, uh, is that, based on what I'm understanding, it just creates um, a binary file by extracting bits and pieces from various parts, putting them together, encrypting, decrypting, replacing bytes, and you end up with um, an injection of a malware. And this was basically a backdoor, so something where somebody could connect to and uh, you know see what's going on on your computer and based on the privileges under which exe is run it can give access to various things so if you run it as root or as a user with high privileges uh, pretty bad you know okay and this takes us to another thing, which is, because there are multiple aspects to this thing. Okay, there are, there's the, the social aspect or the social exploit aspect and how these people manage to get into the project and have access and have control um, they gain the trust of the maintainers and the other contributors by contributing to that uh, code and they ended up by being a maintainer and then move for the kill which was you know injecting the the backdoor and then actually moved to do the same thing in other systems in Debian in Valgrind for Debian, and they tried for Ubuntu, they tried for Fedora, these are the big 
uh, Unix Linux distributions. So this is part of it. Then there's the technical part, which is obfuscating the build process such that you can inject this binary backdoor. But then the, the final thing and one piece that is really important to talk about is the pressure under which open source maintainers operate, right? So imagine this, you start something as a hobby because it's something fun or because it's an interesting problem and you just try your hand at it and you end up implementing something that other people start using and that they find interesting and useful and they start including it into large distributions and then the pressure grows on you to actually implement some more stuff and add features and review pull requests and integrate pull requests and all that. And in the beginning, most likely you are not paid. And by the time you get here, you probably don't get any direct payment for building this software, for maintaining it. You might get some, and you probably get some money from consulting, from, you know, helping other, from your fame, because you are one of the maintainers, so you probably know what you are doing, and maybe people are hiring you, and organizations are hiring you because of this. Maybe you are paid for speaking, maybe you have a Patreon account, and you get some donations. Um, if you're lucky enough, uh, some big organization like Microsoft or Google or Facebook or um, decides to sponsor your project, and but it, you know they don't give you a lot. They give you some some money for for this. And you are always under pressure because so many people depend on it and that's one of the big problems here because the whole the first weak point that was exploited was this imagine a different scenario where the maintainer is actually well paid um, works with a interesting group um, and the group is large enough to well Groups are never large enough to make all the necessary changes and everything that people want, but they can progress at a relatively good pace. Um, and in that case, when somebody else is coming to support you, you might spend a little bit more time vetting them or uh, you might be, you know, check their work better. Uh, you, you might not let this go as easily and so on. So that's a big problem. And the biggest problem, let's see, I just realized that we have an XKCD on this. Uh, let's see if I can quickly find it. Uh, ah, yeah, this. This is actually true. So, a mo all modern digital infrastructure, and you have basically a a very a blocks that are put on top of each other and that support each other. But it's, it's something very shaky. I mean, if you, if there would be an earthquake, everything would fall down. And somewhere near the bottom, you have a project some random person in Nebraska has been thanklessly maintaining since 2003. And this is where we are. Okay, This is the reality of this thing. And so there's an article from 19 March 2018 
by Mike McQuaid called Open Source Maintainers Owe You Nothing. This post is heavily inspired by my experience over the last 10 years participating in the open source community and 8 years as a maintainer of Homebrew, which I've maintained longer than anyone else at this point. Burnout is a big problem for open source software maintainers. This is avoidable. Maintainers can have fun, keep healthy and be productive working long term on open source projects. How? By realizing they have zero obligations to any other maintainers, contributors or users of their software, even if they have personally benefited from the project, e.g. through self-promotion or donation. Is there any basis to state that maintainers have no obligations? In fact, yes in open source licenses themselves. Let's start by looking at the most popular open source license used on GitHub, the MIT license. And it calls the MIT license, the software is provided as is without warranty of any kind and so on. Here is the legalese. Let's turn this legalese into plainer English, now that I'm not a lawyer. The way the software is today is all that the maintainers have agreed to provide you, bugs and all. The maintainer provide no assurances that the software will ever work for any a user or use case, even documented ones, the maintainers are never liable for any problems caused by any use of the software, including damages that require you to pay for repairs. You must agree with the above to have any right to use the software. This isn't just an MIT license thing. In practice, however, when there are issues, maintainers offer work quickly to resolve them and apologize in the same way as a company does. This is one of the biggest causes of burnout. Most open source software is developed by volunteers in their free time, but both maintainers and users of open source software have adopted an unsustainable business customer-like relationship. Most maintainers start working on open source software because it's fun and solves the problem they have. Many continue out of a sense of obligation instead of fun and over time this unpaid, increasingly non-fun work grinds them down. When they make a controversial decision and receive abuse for it, their family, their friends and family starts to ask them if open source is worth the grief. How can we fix this? By having everyone in the open source ecosystem embrace the legal realities of open source. In practice, this means for maintainers, if you're not enjoying work on your work, if you're not enjoying most of your work on a project, don't do it anymore. If users are unwilling to interact on your project without being rude, block them and don't do what they are asked. Don't feel bad about bugs if you introduce us all software has flaws. Yeah, I mean, okay. It's your project. You should do with it as you like. For contributors, defer to maintainers and ensure that you've read all relevant contribution documentation. They are the ones running the project and ultimately their word goes. Understand that it's not the job of the maintainers to teach you how the project works or actually anything. And that's true in this case. For users, remember when filing an issue, opening a pull request or making a comment on a project to be grateful that people spend their free time to build software you get to use for free. Keep your frustrations and unactionable negativity to yourself or at least offline and out of earshot. Don't expect anyone to fix your issues or help you if you are unwilling to dedicate more time to helping yourself than you ask of others. This means reading all the documentation and trying to resolve your own issues before ever asking for any help. If we can all do more of this, then we'll see fewer projects dying because the maintainers cannot hope with the crushing obligations that they have forgotten they do not actually have. Instead, we can have happier maintainers, helpful contributors, and grateful users who all understand where they fit into the open source ecosystem. So, yes, it's... Look, there is a lot of software depends on open source today. And it's unavoidable to require changes to software, to these packages. But... There are different ways of doing this. One of the ways to actually, and the way open source was intended to work, was that you would go read through the documentation, propose a change, and the maintainer would uh, decide whether to introduce the change or turn it back to you and ask you to modify some more things and so on. Um, or just reject it without any explanation. That's also perfectly fine. So, and in case you don't like how a project is going, you can always fork it 
that's the beauty of open source, and improve it. You know, um, nothing stops you. Now, of course, it's not as easy as that because the modified version will not go as easily into uh, the rest of the ecosystem. Uh, distributions like Debian, Fedora, Ubuntu, you know, they will use, uh, they will be conservative in their actions. Uh, so, yeah, you know, there's a lot of stuff here, but basically realize that we are living in an ecosystem, that these people who are maintaining open source are people, and that all the infrastructure that we are using today is based on open source. And that includes very big companies. Now let me close by showing you one thing that happened <laughs> a few days after, which was not, not the best perception of Microsoft um, they get, uh, they push the ticket to FFmpeg. FFmpeg is a um, library and a command line tool for processing video. So it basically knows how to uh, scale videos up and down, how to uh, cut frames, how to combine videos into one, how to um, re-encode to other formats and so on. It's a very powerful tool. It's used by many other um, software that works with video. And they get uh, this, uh, caption FFmpeg fails to decode closed caption to SRT slash WebVTT. So it's a problem with caption, closed captions. Intel caption Microsoft RTMP ingest. Uh, Hi, this is a high priority ticket and the FFmpeg version is currently used in a highly visible product in Microsoft. We have customers experience issues with caption during Teams live event. Please help. So in the midst of all this, and I can understand, look, I can understand the desperation of the people working on Microsoft Teams. I can definitely understand that. I mean, they have customers complaining. Those customers are paying users. They have issues with captions during Teams live events. Uh, presumably somebody complained loudly or they had multiple complaints about this because I guess it's important for a lot of people to have captions. Um, particularly I can imagine in international organization where maybe you do, um, you use AI to translate live or or maybe you have a service that translates, like people actually translating um, live, but also for people who have hearing issues and they can read. So, or maybe some people understand better the written word than what they hear in a foreign language. So there are all kinds of situations like this. and. When you are a company at the size of Microsoft, presumably you have a relevant number of customers who are in this situation. Uh, so you get this as a high priority thing to fix because it's a core uh, feature of your product that is expected by your users. And then you realize that it's actually an issue with FFmpeg. And that FFmpeg is an open source project. So of course you go and you ask, oh, okay, please solve us quickly. It's a high priority ticket and so on. Thing is, you don't decide what's a high priority ticket in open source. Um, that project decides. And that's where things start to get, you see, it's not as nice as it could be. Um, so you see, this is where we are today. And 
I wanted to talk about this because it shows a number of issues in the ecosystem of software. Um, first of all, open source is everywhere. No matter what you are using, if, even if you are using Microsoft, uh, Microsoft has gone very open source friendly in the past years. So chances are you'll have a lot of Microsoft, a lot of uh, open source things in your stack. Um, also, many tools that you are using will use open source libraries. And if you typically, if you go in help or somewhere in the tool, you'll figure, you'll see a list of open source libraries that are used or in the readme file because they have to publicize what open source libraries they are using. This is due to the licensing. Um, so you have this, and, and by the way, this applies to closed source projects as well, because some open source licensing licenses are permissible and you can use them, for example, MIT, you can use them in commercial projects and closed source projects as long as if you make any changes, they go back to the initial tool, they go back to um, the public, which is absolutely fine. So we have this, these building blocks and some of them are maintained by people who are doing it as a hobby and have little time to fix everything and are not paid for doing that. And some of it is done by you know, large organizations. And some of it is done by small, medium companies who want to solve their own problems and so on. Um, but in the end, every user, every software user will use some open source and most likely every developer will use some open source directly or indirectly. And given the, this, we have, a, we have a high challenge, a very difficult challenge of maintaining security for these types of projects. And what this seems to show is that one way, one thing we'll need to take into account is pay these people. It's not the only thing, but it might help, you know, if you are using, a, so, and that's a big problem with financing open source projects. But part of it is donations, part of it is, you know, Patreon or whatever. Uh, some kind of subscriptions, but you can also donate on GitHub. You can also donate on, uh, on other places. So maybe one thing we could do is donate a little bit to the projects that we are using. Another thing that we maybe we could do is convince our organizations to donate a little bit to the projects that we are using as an in, inside an organization. Now, I'm no expert in this in any way. It's a very complex problem, but it seems to me that we are headed towards a point where this will become a real challenge. Because this type of attack, if it was possible, for this tool, question is, didn't it already happen or will it not happen to other tools that are included in every major distribution and presumably also in most server systems that you are using in the cloud um, and so on. And okay, we are counting on large companies like Amazon, like Microsoft to figure out that there are some security issues here. And maybe GitHub will take some uh, measures here to figure out what, you know, if people are to identify suspicious behavior of people who want to take over such projects. 
but it's a precedent and it shows us that it's possible to to do this so uh i don't know i don't have any complete answers uh, but it is a fascinating story and i hope you found it interesting as well so what do you think uh, should i go more into one of the stories of today uh, or should i go into some other stories let us know if you have any links and interesting things that uh, you think any paper that you'd like uh, a reaction to let us know in the comments or contact us as tdws at mosaicworks.com with a z uh, and um, we love comments so please leave us comments what you think about this whole situation are you maintaining an open source project and how are you doing with it are you okay with telling users you know that's all the time i have i don't owe you anything um, let us know in the comments have you used an open source project and have you contributed to an open source project what do you feel about this whole ecosystem let us know in the comments thank you kindly for the view and until next time remember to think design and work smart.